Welcome back to the program. Tonight, my first guest is probably the only man in the world who can claim to be an actor, director, producer, comedian, author, and physician. He was the host of the PBS series, The Body in Question, and this is his latest book right here. It's called The Facts of Life. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan Miller. Thank you for being here on uh, Columbus Day. I hate to ruin your holiday like this. Yes, it really is. It certainly ate into it. But... <laughs> Tell me about the, uh, the, the the PBS series, The Body in Question. Now, the times that I saw the show, how many how many uh, elements were in the series? There were 13. 13. Now, maybe this happened only the one time, yeah. but it seemed like you were... You had an array of... Uh, organs. Human organs. Yes. And you were describing them mm. in fascinating detail, and then also... Cutting into them. Yes. Yes. Now, that seemed awfully strange. Well, it, yes, it, I suppose it is, really. I mean, uh, uh, they weren't my organs, for a start. No. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and they were the organs of someone who'd lost interest in them uh -huh. at the time. So, um, <laughs> um, it, was, it was all right. It, it does seem an odd thing to cut into them. I mean, I think what startled people was how much like a butcher's slab it looked. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can remember, in fact, I, I believe it was the liver. Mm -hmm. And it was just, boom, right there, and wacko, you had uh, cutlets or something. And it was... Uh, well, it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very similar to yeah. that. Now, is there, is, there, is there an ethical question involved? I'm, I'm sure there isn't, if you're doing it. Yes, there is an ethical question. You can't just, uh, you know, take organs as you want to and play around with them. I mean, you couldn't just simply get them on a comedy show, for example, um, <laughs> even with permission, I don't think. Yeah, you know, we have I mean, tried and tried. tried. I know. Well, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's quite hard to know how you would actually ask for permission as well. You know, you say, yeah. we've got this comic show well, how... coming up. Um, uh, is your liver free? Um, <laughs> say... But how, as uh, you as a doctor, how do you get them? Where do you get them? Well, what you do is you, uh, you approach relatives. Um, very softly on tiptoe and, <laughs> and say, look, we have this comedy show coming up. Uh, is, is his liver free uh -huh. at the time? And he says, no, it's appearing on the West Coast at the moment, yeah. uh, on the Carson show, for But, it, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was stunning to watch because yeah. it, you, it gave you a whole different perspective as to actually... Well, you see, most people don't know what they've got inside at no. all. And you can't, uh, you can't know by concentrating on it because you wouldn't mm -hmm. know what to concentrate on. Yeah. I mean, you think very hard and you still don't know what you've got inside. Now, now you as a doctor, is there a point where even today uh, handling those and, and cutting them up makes you a little queasy or are you way beyond that? Well, I mean, it would make me... Yes, it does make one queasy, really. It doesn't make you queasy if you're in the right setting. If you're in the autopsy room, then you're not thinking of being in a restaurant. Um, if you go too quickly to a restaurant after being in the autopsy room, then there can be a clash of interests, uh -huh. as it were. But, uh, <laughs> Oh my! Uh, tell me about the uh, the uh, the commander of the Order of Great Britain. Of oh, the Britain. British Empire. Yeah, the, the British Empire. Oh, well, that, that's rather an embarrassing thing to talk about. You know, I mean, what happens is that every year, twice a year, in fact, um, the Queen hands out a series of decorations mm -hmm. for people who've uh, done one thing: either defused bombs, or put on shows, or done exports, or discovered. Uh, how the liver works, or something of that sort, and, and there are a series of ranked orders which go all the way from medals, called the MBE, up to knighthoods and beyond. Uh -huh. I mean, it's just a sort of stratospheric orders called the Order of Merit, and I, I came in for one of these things called the CBE, uh -huh. which what, is Commander had, of the British Empire. What had you done to get your CBE? I'd, I'd simply lived long enough, I think, really, mm -hmm. and been around... Yeah. Um, they just uh, go through and, the phone and, book and, and, and periodically? And kept my liver to myself, yeah, and yeah. all my organs were intact, and she said, well, we'll give it to him. <laughs> and, uh, no, I suppose I'd been in showbiz long enough and done uh -huh. enough plays and so forth. And so what is the ceremony like? Well, it's, it's, it, it's rather touching, really, because you get... A, a range of people all together. It's rather a democratic thing, in spite of what people think, because it's um, um, in, the, in that you get lots of people who defuse bombs and right. uh, uh, and rescued children from canals and uh, people who've discovered how cancer works and so yeah. forth. And they're all herded together in this ballroom, uh, watched by proud relatives, uh, with an orchestra playing in a little balcony, medleys from Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> and uh, and that's exactly what goes on. Yeah. In fact, had you met the Queen before? I'd met her once at a luncheon. Uh, now, what is that like? Is she? Is there any way possible you can have any kind of rapport with a woman, or is it all behind a facade that she has to maintain? Well, no, she's she's really very friendly, and she's rather witty as well. Yeah. One's often surprised by how forceful she is. I mean, when you see her on television, she often looks a great deal more um, sort of frosty and disdainful mm -hmm. than you might think. But actually, she's extremely forceful, very witty, and very knowledgeable. Um, the only thing that's slightly odd is when you wait for her to arrive at something like a uh, a luncheon. Uh, 
you're all there very embarrassed in a room talking to Aquarius and aides and so forth and suddenly there's a sort of rustling and scuffling out in the corridor as, and then suddenly hundreds of dogs are released into the room before she comes <laughs> corgis or you know very small uh -huh. legs who all then make a tremendous dive for your crotch so you stand there <laughs> while talking to her pretending that these things are not sniffing you you uh -huh. see and you're sort of saying, you're saying well, I'm sorry about that they're saying uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am and you're sort of pushing these dogs away from you and you, you see men all around the room with these uh, yeah. with these corgis sniffing at them. You know. Is this her idea of a joke, or is this a, um, just a, an icebreaker? I think it's, a, uh, yes, it's, it, it, it sort of gets conversation yeah, going. Yeah, I would, I would think so. And you say, uh, uh, but it's, um, it's also because she's surrounded by these creatures. Yeah. She loves them. She yeah. loves dogs and horses, you know. Yeah. I think probably Did you hurt yourself people. on that? Um, I, I, I'm coming round now. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> okay, well, I tell you what, we'll uh, take a break here for a commercial. Let him regain his senses. We'll be back with Jonathan We're here with uh, Dr. Jonathan Miller. Now, you uh, were in the Beyond the Fringe. Is that the, the name was. of the review? That, that is the name of it. Uh, yes. Tell folks what this is for those who may not uh, know what we're talking about. Well, yes, this happened about 25 years ago. Um, well, yes, a bit, a bit less than that, 22 years ago. And uh, four of us, Dudley Moore, uh, and, and then there was Alan Bennett and Peter Cook and myself, mm -hmm. this got was, together. You uh, were in medical school at the time? No, I was already a doctor by then. No kidding. And I was working in a casualty department, and someone came to me and said, what, what I like. I mean, it just doesn't mean that people were cruising the streets. Um, going into casualty departments, asking if people if they'd like to do satirical shows, you know, um, and people dropped the instruments and said, yes, I don't mind if I do, yeah. I'll be with you later, dear. Um, um, but so that was more or less how it happened, and I, uh, I joined this team, and we started doing a show at the Edinburgh Festival, and uh -huh. then it, it came to London, it was very so successful. So, originally then. it was a one-time only deal, or...? Yes, it was. I was, yeah. I was intending to do it as a vacation between two jobs, mm -hmm. you see. I was doing a, um, I, I was doing this job, I mean, this surgical job, and, uh, I had to drop it like a hot potato and ask people to and put people on hold, as it were. Yeah. Uh, what kind of things were you doing in the review? Well, there were it was all sorts of stuff. We covered satirical material, which I suppose it was it was a pioneer in that way. I mean, long before things like Saturday Night Live and that lot got going, it started making attacks on political situations. It attacked um, some of the fatuous ideas of of nuclear warfare and deterrence. We had a civil defence sketch, which which uh, made remarks about some of the absurdities. Well, I mean, they tended to treat civil defense at that time as if nuclear war was nothing more than a thunderstorm, which you'd have to get out of. Um, <laughs> I mean, I remember there was a... Uh, we, had, we had this... Uh, Dudley Moore was up in the audience. He used to ask cod questions, and he used to say things like, um, I have a question. Um, in the event of uh, the Holocaust, um, how, how soon will it be before normal public services are resumed? And one of us would rise and say, that's a very fair question. Uh, following Armageddon, um, following Armageddon, we do hope to have public services working pretty smoothly fairly soon after the event. Although I feel in all fairness, I must point out that it must needs be something in the nature of a skeleton service. Well, you see, at that time, um, th that was... Th those sort of things, uh, those sort of jokes and jests about it still seem to be applicable mm -hmm. today. So it was, a, it was a topical show, but it was the first time that anyone had ever made specific remarks about nuclear war on a stage. Yeah. Um, it was the first time anyone had ever imitated a living politician in England on a stage. We, Peter Cook impersonated Harold Macmillan. We, we took off um, the, some of the absurdities and sentimental myths of the Second World War. And all these things were really quite unforgivable at that mm -hmm. time. It yeah. seemed like... I mean, they were at that time very pioneering. It seems rather dilute, I think, in some ways now. But because, uh, you know, people have advanced through the hole that we made in the, uh, mm. in the wall. Mm. But um, it was the beginning of that sort of political satire, I think, both in England and America. So now, uh, if I understand correctly, you're going back to medicine more on a full-time basis, Well, I've right? been directing in the theatre now for about 20 years, and I think I've done most of the things I really want to, apart mm -hmm. from... There are a few you also that, direct mm, opera? Or yeah, you... I direct opera as well. Yeah. And I've done most of the operas I want to do now, except for Don Giovanni, which I'll do at the end of the Yeah, I'd year. love to do that one myself. It's a nice one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, come on in, Dave. <laughs> Uh, so now, why why return to medicine full time? Not that it isn't a. Uh, well, I can't go back and treat patients. I'd be much too dangerous, and I'd leave all these organs you talked about all over the floor. If now, if, I, if you were going to go back into practice, what sort of a doctor would you be? Well, I'm I'm interested in neurological research. I, I the I, brain. Yeah, I'm interested in brain damage and some of the disorders that follow from brain damage, mm -hmm. and that's really how I spend most of my time now. Yeah. I see patients who've had strokes. And so now, forth. let me ask you uh, just a couple of questions mm. about the brain. Do we know? 
uh, more about the brain than we don't know, or we the, the unknown is more than what we do know? I think it's vastly more than we know, uh, and we've only just touched the surface of it, and very little at that. Yeah. Um, we know enormously more than we used to, say, 25 or 30 years ago, but we still haven't got anywhere near explaining um, how we find our way out of the room without advice. <laughs> uh, Let me, uh, another question. You know, when somebody will say, remember uh, when Uncle, uh, remember Uncle Bill's second wife, and you go, mm, yeah, what, mm, and you, yeah, so like a half tongue. an hour later, yeah, yeah, tip of the tongue, it just appears yeah. in yeah. your head. Now, how does that happen? Well, and a, what was her name? Well, it's a very interesting, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting business. It's a recognized phenomenon. It's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon, or the TOT. They always go in for acronyms. Uh -huh. um, and if you notice, if you, if you write down all the false attempts you make, Mm -hmm. and take great care to do it the next time it happens because it's very interesting and then look at the right result when you finally get it you'll always find that all the false attempts bear a relationship to the right answer oh, really? that they for example they phonetically are very similar. They right. scan the same. They have the same uh, sort of rhythm. So it's a form of deductive reasoning? Well, well, it's not that. It's just that what you're seeing is something about the filing system under which these things are headed. I see. They're often, they're filed away under things which are phonetically similar, and they're also filed away under names which have the same meaning. Yeah. So that you'll, you, you'll often um, remember a name which is, uh, uh, say, if, you, if someone's called Ratner, you'll probably have someone saying, um, it's catnip. Yeah. Now, cat and rat are related to one another because, in fact, cats chase rats, yeah. and so that you're getting a filing system. So you just uh, really are ruffling through, as it were, a, a huge card catalog. That's until right. You hit the... But the card catalog goes in different directions. Yeah. There's a card catalog which is under phonetic similarities, but there's also a card catalog under meaning similarities or yeah. meaning connection. So this is the one of the things we do know about the brain. Well, we, it's not about the brain, it's about the mind. We don't know how the brain does it, but, we, but, it's, but it's certainly by looking at the way in which people uh, perform under tests, yeah. we've learned a lot about how the mind works. We don't quite know how the hardware does what the mind does. Well, when you get some uh, progress on this, we're all, I'll keep you back. in close touch. Oh, time. sure. There don't go good. anywhere else. Come right here. Don't publish <laughs> it in a medical don't, journal. Don't, you'll be Come the first right here. to know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, the new book, this is a fascinating uh, bit of work, by the way, The Facts of the Life. Facts of life. Uh, Jonathan Miller. Uh, nice to meet you, sir. Very Thank nice you for to being see you. Thank uh, you. Uh, station identification here, folks. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.